All right, so we, um, we left the last lecture with this graph and talked about diurnal vertical migration. And we see that during the daytime in the, in the, in the light, the concentrations of Daphne are quite low. Um, and they've, they've moved down, you know, it looks as if they've moved down to 80 meters, you know, so that's a pretty good uh, swim, you know, going down 80 meters and for something that's, you know, less than a millimeter in size. Um, and, and then at night, well, when they can get up and eat the algae, which is one of the main food sources, they are, they, um, they go up to the top. Um, now they can't eat bacteria, so they are able to get some stuff down here. It's just that they're so much less efficient at bacteria-sized particles, as, as we talked about previously in the chapter on microbes. Um, and we talked about also, uh, yeah, so uh, the filter feeding. And that's because the Reynolds number and that their little um, filtering appendages don't work so well. So there's some other things that Daphne can do in response to predation. Uh, they can dive or swarm, so they can actually, just like birds form flocks, and they can all be on the lookout for, for some, something, um, they can, they can uh, go away from, find ways to alarm and, and try to swim away from, from any predator. Um, Daphne has very simple eye spots, um, so they can detect light and dark, and they can get the light direction. Um, and they can get dark objects, but they're not going to be able to resolve anything very well because they're so small and you need a lot more cells to be able to resolve like, oh, that's a fish coming at me, right? It's just a dark object. And, um, at least I assume so. Um, I, I have not been in the brain of a Daphne before, so we'll see. Um, th there's other things that they can do. We talked about spines um, and, uh, and cyclomorphosis earlier on under when we talked about um, the diversity of organisms and how, how um, you can't always use morphology as an indicator. So you could go to a lake when there's not any predatory fish around and see Daphne that doesn't have much of a helmet or a spine and then um, later in the summer after the fish have uh, reproduced and there's a bunch of fish chemical in the water then all of a sudden they'll have, they'll have spines you know or maybe a calabarus or some other chemical signal that uh, from a predator that causes them to try to get, get past um, that. So the other things they can do, and these last two were related to a study around here that a, a doctoral student of mine did a lot of years ago. And they were interested in um, what juvenile walleye were eating and what made them successful in different lakes. Um, and so that's what the uh, Department of Fish, Wildlife and Parks at that time, and now it's uh, tourism, Fish, Wildlife, Park and Tourism, uh, funded us to look at, and, and I got funded to look at the zooplankton and the algae, and then, and then my colleague, uh, Chris Guy at the time, got funded to look at the, at the walleye uh, larvae and their reproduction and, and condition and what they're eating. Uh, but there are two species of Daphnia uh, in these lakes that, that dominated. And they had interesting responses, because we'll talk about the seasonal succession in the reservoirs, but essentially, when you get this burst of larval fish, they're putting out a bunch of fish carry them on com compound. It's just coming off of them. And it turns out that actually a lot of times these compounds aren't put out by the fish, but it's by the bacteria that are on the fish. Um, but in any case, um, there's a chemical cue. It's present at very low concentrations. It's also very difficult to get at because it's very labile. So you can't really, most of these have not been isolated. But in any case, the experiments were to just take fish juice and put it in aquaria where, where these daphne were growing. And uh, there's one, one of the species produced diapausing eggs in response to the chemical cues. And these are aphipia. And remember when Daphne reproduces, it can either do so as uh, females and, and self-fertilize or they can uh, create males and the males then could reproduce sexually with them and they produce this resistant uh, thing. And this, and this resistant uh, Aphipia can sink down and, and really live for years in the sediments until things get good. But at least it took them out of the water column so during the time when the predation pressure was really high. The other species had an interesting response, and that is they reproduce more quickly at smaller size. Um, so basically, they, they, sh they shortened their generation time and, um, and created eggs and reproduced more quickly uh, in, in, uh, in response to fish chemicals. So why might this help? to reproduce at a smaller size.
question of the day. So the first one drops out of the water column, but the second one stays in the water column um, and reproduces at smaller size. And we've got some good answers. Um, so yeah, they have to hit um, maturity quicker, uh, but why, you know, why that would help, and some people got it. Um, I think one of the very first answers actually was kind of it. Um, if you're smaller, uh, these sight feeding larval fishes can't see you as well. So they're, and the payoff is not as good. So um, mostly uh, a, a predator will be optimizing its energy input and it'll take the bigger food before it takes the smaller food as long as it can, as long as it, as it can get it. Um, in addition, if they're reproducing more quickly, they're making up for any, more, any predation more quickly, right? They're, it, they're um, assuming they, they ha uh, hatch the same number of, of offspring, they would be increasing their population more rapidly. And so, so there's, there's that as well. Okay, good. If you forgot to answer, please put the answer in the, something in that chat. I, I, got most of it i think most of you did but um okay so there's the pre we've been talking about how you deal with predation but the other side of the coin is if you're a predator how do you become a good predator um and it's again always uh an idea of uh response to evolutionary pressure and how you can get the most prey uh, um or the best food intake with the minimum amount of effort. Um, so one of the basic ones is, uh, is hide and wait versus active uh, foraging. So, so some predators just sit there and wait for the things to come along and they snag them and others are, are actively go out and forage. If you have, um, a predator on you, it may be better to hide and wait versus active foraging. We'll talk about those trade-offs in a little bit. And we can think about this as far as uh, fishes, and it really relates to their morphology. Can anybody tell me um, how, how a hide and wait fish might uh, vary morph morphologically from a species that is an active forager? Hide and wait might have camouflage. Yeah, that's a good one. <clears throat> Let's talk about body form a little bit. Right, uh, Mac has that one. Might not be as streamlined, right? So an active forager needs to be out there chasing stuff. So it needs to be streamlined, whereas something that is just sitting there doesn't necessarily need to be quite as streamlined. Um, any, anybody else have any ideas on that? Yeah, it could be a flat pancake salmon. Stronger tail muscles. Yeah, good, Abigail. Can you explain that a little bit, what you mean, why, why, you, why you say that? And who has the stronger tail muscles? Okay, so which, which one needs to be able to sprint more? The waiting one, good, right. So basically, you think of a fish like a pike, and it's not a super great long distance fast swimmer. It can't run down its prey necessarily but it sits there and it curls up in an in a S shape and it has a big old wide tail and big old muscles there. And so when it sees its prey, it just explodes and hits it, right? Um, and that's also what the dragonflies do, right? The dragonfly larvae, they have those, those uh, that lady that comes out and, and gets things. So it just sits there very still and waits till something comes close and snags it. Right, so there's these adaptations. Um, there are also sensory adaptations, uh, sight, visual, hydrodynamic, electrical, chemical. So some really amazing things like the paddle fishes have highly developed electrical sensors, right? Um, and they use these to, uh, to, to sense the very small electrical currents that come off of their prey. Uh, apparently they can detect a single daphnia, of an invertebrate the size of a single daphnia from the electric. Uh, current is coming off from their neural activity. So why would this be a good adaptation for a paddlefish? They live in large rivers. Why would this be a, uh, a good, related to their habitat? Why would this be a good way to, to uh, find prey? Good, Tom. Yeah, low sight, right? So you're not gonna have much light. 
And so things like uh, catfishes have barbels that are highly sensitive. And they go around and kind of use them to feel, or they oftentimes the big ones will just sit and wait, you know, and then something comes along and bam, they'll get it. Um, and uh, so sensory adaptations, a hydrodynamic. So there's also, there's also the lateral line system on fishes that they can detect vibrations. Um, in addition, um, a pre predatory invertebrates can also detect hydro, um, hydrodynamic. So you think about it, and basically hydrodynamic is basically sound waves, right? It's variations in pressure. And so many freshwater organisms and marine organisms are, are very sensitive to changes in pressure because they're essentially sound waves. Um, and, and they can use that if an organism's swimming, they can sort of hear it swimming. And, and if it's, they can tell what size it is from the kind of, kind of signal they're getting and, and, and go after that. Um, and chemical, uh, those barbels on the catfish are also quite uh, sensitive to chemicals. Um, and you, you can smell prey uh, in, in water as well. The visual uh, sight ones are, yeah, obvious that, that we have organisms that are in light and they can, um, a lot, mostly the fishes, although some invertebrates also can see for relatively well and could use that as, as a way to find. Um, we can talk about a little bit about the functional response curves. Um, some organisms just respond to wh what organisms are there and others will only feed um, based on how many are there. So we already talked about that essentially when we talked about Daphne feeding. Um, there's also the idea of the ecology of fear and that is that predators have to are also prey. So they do need to adapt to dealing with uh, being, uh, being eaten. And so you may have to shut down being a predator or not forage in a place where you're, where you're uh, susceptible to being prey. So um, here's an example of, um, of modification of uh, choosing food and optimizing optimized uh, food input. So in this, case it was just basically bluegill and they put daphne in with a, 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 a fish that he a zooplanktivorous fish and they and this is the low low density ones and they have daphne that are different sizes 1.4 2.5 and 3.6 millimeters so this one's twice as big as that as over twice as big as as these are and when we have a, a low prey density Right, the bluegills are taking everything they can get, regardless of size. So they're going for the selectivity index, the, um, the relative proportion in the gut relative to the proportion that they were placed in the environment, right? So what they, they do uh, relative to their, their encounter rates. And they're basically one to one, one. So anytime a bluegill saw a daphnia in low density, it would take uh, the daphnia. In contrast, they put um, what is this three uh, twelve times as many uh, twelve times as many uh, Daphne per bluegill in, in these arena experimental arenas, <clears throat> and we see that with the high density of food, they really heavily favored these big Daphne, right? Uh, and and so if there's a bunch of good stuff out there, uh, if there's a bunch of stuff out there, you go for the good stuff. You know, if you're starving to death, you'll eat anything. If uh, there's tons of food, you're going to pick out the, sh the, you know, the shrimp and the caviar, and uh, you know, and leave the turnips or whatever. And you'll take the big steak instead of the small steak, if that's what you. you know, I mean, if you're vegetarian, obviously not. Um, okay, so this is uh, d modified by food density and optimizing energy intake. Obviously, the more, um, the the more. Uh, common food is, but also you can think of food quality as being something that, that organisms are going to try to try to optimize. Done this one. Oh, I should say we need to remember this one um, because um, when we get to the trophic cascade, the Daphne, uh, larger Daphne, are more effective predators of of phytoplankton, so it's going to make a difference there. And we'll get to that pretty soon. Um, 
non-lethal effects of, of predators. Uh, many predators don't kill prey, but can alter their survival. So let's get some examples from you of predators that don't kill their prey, but um, alter their survival. And you can't put the macrophytes in because they're down there in the bottom, and I've already provided you one. Uh, parasites, great, Abigail, yeah. So a parasite is not gonna be effective if it kills its host, although sometimes they do, right? So many diseases and parasites are, are viruses essentially are, um, they don't necessarily kill their whole prey. Um, so viruses do kill their whole prey if they're uh, preying upon single cells, but you know, large animals like us, we get a cold, it kills some cells and, and uh, it doesn't, doesn't, it just slows us down. Any other examples that you can think of? Viruses, yeah. Um, so that's a little bit, that's, a, that's not a non-lethal effect of, of predation lane of a predator eating your predator, right? Uh, but that'll be the top-down control. So that's a little bit, that's an indirect interaction, right? So these are direct interactions, non-lethal effects. Yeah, make it hard. Yeah, yeah, make it harder for prey to go out and feed. Um, so you can alter their survival. That's right. So we just talked about the ecology of fear, right? The idea that you can't forage as much if you're afraid. Well, then you're going to get less food. So that's an indirect, uh, uh, non-lethal effect of predation. Humans and cows. Yeah, I, I would say yes. Uh, humans and cattle, sort of. Certainly, humans and dairy cows would be an example. So when we take something away from them, but in the end, we're, it's almost more of a mutualism there. So, um, yeah. So there's a lot of different ways they can alter their survival. Um, we can. We we talked about the Daphnia and, and how some of them might just drop out of the population for a while, right? And so they, even if they're, they're not eating. Oh, I should go back and say the other chemical cue that Daphnia can use to and some other organisms can use, is not only the thing that's coming from the fish or the bacteria that eat them, but also if there are mashed up Daphnia chemicals around. It means somebody's eating them and smushing them, right? And so it, it, can, it can cause them to, um, to have a predator, a response to predators based on, on conspecifics being crunched up. All right. So as I promised, we're gonna get into food chains, food webs, and um, We'll talk about uh, trophic cascades. So the simple food chain, we've already sort of been over this, that we have a, a producer uh, of some sort, a primary consumer, a secondary consumer, and decomposers. So you don't want to have all the organic carbon going off. And so there's a feedback loop to get the organic material back into the food web. It's a very simple linear viewpoint. And in some instances, it's probably an accurate representation of what's going on in the real world. Um, but food webs are probably more realistic that, as we talked about at the very beginning of, of this chapter, many stream organisms, for example, eat at multiple levels of the food web and they're omnivorous. Um, and omnivores are very common um, in fresh waters. And generalists tend to be more common, I think, than specialists. Um, so it's a little bit more difficult to work with. We get into very quick complexity, uh, complexity very quickly. And we'll talk about that a little bit, but you can just imagine this web of interactions that each species has, um, and they're all in, uh, interacting directly and indirectly with each other. So if you don't, if you have a simple line, you can kind of you know this affects this, that affects this. You can you can make theoretically understand it easier than more easily than than, uh, than if you have a web. So the one sort of big um, food chain argument that has got a lot of traction and, and uh, a lot of support and empirical support as well from some systems is the trophic cascade. And um, in 1880, um, uh, Camerano put this idea out that predators can control herbivores and increase the biomass of producers, right? So predators can eat the primary consumers, uh, secondary consumers can eat primary consumers, and this decreased pressure on the on the primary producers would allow them to grow more. 
And it, and it does amaze me at some of these, how early on some of these concepts came up ecologically. So this is right around the time of Darwin, right? There's just an explosion in understanding about how things work. But it, when I was a graduate student, it was a hot topic, trophy cascade. Um, and people didn't really realize how long the idea had been knocking around. There's a long-term argument on that. And one of the uh, professors that used to be here was, was one, one of the early arguers on why it might be important to have uh, consider predators. And his idea is, why is the world green? Right, the, the, the ideas, um, the, the arguments were why is, what is it that makes it that when we go out into, you know, in the summer in Kansas, that there's, there's trees everywhere, right? And there's grasses and, and, and why, don't the, why don't the predators, eat, uh, the herbivores eat everything up? Right, why are lakes green? Why don't they eat everything up? And the argue, one of the arguments is, well, they, they are being, the, the herbivores are being eaten by predators and they're controlling it from the top. So this gets at the idea of top down versus bottom up control. So top down control would be the food chain, um, the something controls the herbivores, right? And that increases the primary productivity. What are some examples of bottom-up control? And I'll give you a hint. Those would be physical or chemical um, factors for primary, the controlling primary producers. So why in an oligotrophic lake, it, would it be hard for primary producers to get a foothold? Specifically, what is it that's li limiting their growth? Low nutrients, good. Right, so low nutrients is one thing. What else is something that might limit primary production in systems, right? Of autotrophs? Sunlight, great, yeah. So those would be bottom-up control. Nutrients and, and sunlight would be bottom-up control. So if that's the dominant thing, um, if a system, you know, a groundwater system, right, uh, it may be fairly low nutrient, but also very low energy input because nobody can get that. That, and that would be a bottom-up control. Um, but maybe they're protozoa and they, they eat the bacteria in the groundwater, so maybe there's a top-down control even there. Um, it just depends. One of the ideas is to use biomanipulation to control trophic state. So the idea being that you could control the populations of herbivorous, of, that control the herbivorous organisms and drive down the negative effects of eutrophication. So this is an example of how that might work. Um, the one thing we have in this side would be, so we have a predator, right? And it's eating the things that are eating the zooplankton. What do you notice about the fact when that predator is not there, right? There's more of the things that eat the zooplankton, but what would you notice about the, the characteristics of these two um, uh, communities of zooplankton? Fat daphnia, yeah. Fat daphnia, and um, <clears throat> there's a, uh, so these are rotifers right here, right? These little things are rotifers. This is, you know, not quite to scale, but, um, we have more big herbivores, right? And I told you we would get back to this, that we have um, a situation where if you're a large daphnia, you're a more efficient filter feeder and can eat more. You need more algae and you can eat more algae, right? So you, you, your efficiency is higher if, if you're bigger. These guys can't make it when there's a bunch of zooplankton boards around because they're yummy, yummy food like we saw with the zooplankton um, and the bluegill experiment, right? And we have a shift then into the situation that we've got a small daphnia, like maybe this is the one that was reproducing more quickly, right? And at a smaller size and then rotifers, we move over to rotifers. And then what do you see as a difference in, in the um, uh, algal? types that are here. So we have a, a big colonial thing and dinobrian. Um, there's more algae, right? So the algal biomass is higher. Um, 
if there's less predation pressure, they can be smaller, right? So these these little green blobs here, they're not green. I should make it some color, I guess. But these little green blobs are 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 not as eaten as efficiently. So you can get more small algae. So when we looked at the phyto, uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton, uh, zooplankton communities in Potawatomi State Lake number two on the end of the season, we had a lot of this stuff, stuff that was too big to eat. And um, quite, a, quite a few rotifers and some small daphne. And that was, uh, so we had a, a situation, maybe more, more like this, but pretty much um, so, somewhere in between these two. There's a lot of fishing pressure, so the largest ones. So what's a manager going to do to control the trophic cascade? What, what kind of regulations might you put in? Or management actions, specific management actions. You want to decrease, you, you basically want to get to this situation right here. So you're getting, getting rid of the nasty algae blooms from increased nutrients. Um, fishing limits, yeah. What, like what? Yeah, size, that's right. Like what size? <laughs> Only the big ones can be kept. Um, so no, you don't want to leave the small ones, right? Because the small ones are the ones you're trying to get rid of. Right? You want to make it so there's big ones. They're, they're big pis, piscivores, things that fish that eat fishes, right? Small version of the big one. Yeah, so you just want to, you, you, you want to let the things that are going to get big, big. So you want to limit the takes of the species, the small ones of the species. But if you, somebody has a way to get the smaller ones out that are eating the zooplankton, you know, the bluegills, the coffees, whatever around here, then maybe maybe you want to have them take more. And the other extreme version of this was just eat, poison the whole damn thing, right? And get all the fish out. So all you've got is zooplankton and algae. Um, but people don't like that for the most part. Give the big ones guns. <laughs> they already have guns. All right. So this is the idea of the trophic cascade. It, it has been criticized. And the reason for that is that evolution over time should make up for things, right? That as you, as you go through evolutionary time, the, the, it should reestablish a balance. <clears throat> and that some people feel that over evolutionary time, over a long period, really bottom up is the only thing that, that is, is, uh, is going to be effective uh, because in controlling whether the world's green or not. Because Daphne will find a way to adapt to this predation and, and skirt around it, right? So there's always this arms race, and the, and, the, and the predators and the prey are evolving to try to become either better predators or more resistant to predation. And, and so over time, you might get something like this. And we'll talk about something that happens when the stable states of lakes. Related to this, and that's our next. Uh, that, that's our next um, point. So in here, they did do the just take all the fish out experiment in the lakes and the, and some small lakes in the Netherlands. And so we have this is a four year experiment. On time is on the x axis on all of these graphs. The error bars are around the estimates of each of these. And so they just use nets to take fishes out. So they drop the, the fish, total fish population from about 700 down to about 200. And they slowly started coming back. And as expected, right, initially, they really, the Daphne population was low. The amount, the, mil, the mass of Daphne and milligrams per liter was low. And as soon as they took the fish out, boom, they really took off, right? And then they slowly went down. Well, why is it they went down? Well, if we look at this, the out chlorophyll was really high because Daphnia predation was low. As soon as Daphnia went up, the chlorophyll went way down. 
And, but eventually, um, you know, the daphnia dropped off, but the chlorophyll stayed down. So what's going on here, right? So the daphnia population right here in year four is right back to where it was right here, right? But then the, it, didn't, it doesn't match up. So why do the macrophytes increase when the phytoplankton decrease? Um, more light available, right? That's, that's a big part of it, right? That if you have algal blooms, um, on the surface, the macrophytes can't get a hold. And in addition to that, there appear to be chemical interactions between the two. And so once the macrophytes are able to get established, they actually put chemicals out into the water that inhibit phytoplankton. So that's another example of chemical, in, me, chemical mediated interactions, uh, interference competition, right? Um, they're not actually taking necessarily taking the same things because the phytoplankton can take the light from them so if they can zap them, right, they can interfere with their ability to do that. So what we get is an alternative stable state. <clears throat> we'll talk about this again. The idea that once a lake shifts over to macrophytes, you can control the phytoplankton population. So in this case, the primary production might end up being the same even though the chlorophyll dropped out and the macrophytes went up, right? The total primary production might be the same. When we talk about um, how to um, deal with lakes and their trophic state, one of the things that people want to do is take the macrophytes out. And that's not necessarily a good thing to have all the macrophytes out because they'll actually knock back the, the algal populations, right, as well. So we started with this sort of simple linear food web idea, and all of a sudden we're saying, oh, yeah, but there's macrophytes, right? Um, you know, what happens if you have a fish that eats it, both zooplankton and other fishes. So there's all kinds of things that, that could make it more complex than it seems from the beginning. There can also be trophic cascades in rivers. And this is an example from Mary Power. And um, Mary did some really, really interesting work over, over the years. She's now at Berkeley, and um, this is from the Eel River. In California, but she also did similarly related things in uh, streams in Oklahoma, where we we have stone rollers that that are herbivorous uh, fishes and bass, which are predators. And when the bass were there, they knocked the stone rollers out, and the algae on the bottom of the stream came up. In this case, um, they're interested in steelhead, which is a really important um, recreational uh, and also a traditional species for the for the natives there. Um, and we see that when the steelhead are there, um, they, um, they eat the roach and steelback fry on predatory insects, or they tend to force them to hide and not, uh, not be predators on the midge larvae. The midge larvae then are able to control the benthic algae. In this case, it's clodoph the clodophora, the green al alga clodophora. In contrast, if the steelhead are taken out, so like, um, you know the biology of steelhead, why, what, what might be common to keep steelhead out? Anybody know what type of um, life history steelhead have? So we got a few fish ecologists in here, so <clears throat> fish managers. Oh, it's getting close to the end. I'm gonna give you the answer. Uh, they, they, they run out into the ocean. They're, uh, they're anadromous and reproduce in, in the, um, in the rivers, just like salmon do. And so if you put it in the dam, you, you, they won't come in. So in this case, when you got, took the steelhead out, the predators, the roach and stickleback fry, ate the midge larvae and the benthic algae took off. All right. Okay. <clears throat> 